to illuminate, to explain, to deepen understanding, theory informing practice. That's the focus of this video, how evaluation theory improves evaluation practice. But it's not all illumination and light. Sometimes it's a battle of ideas, of positions, of paradigms, of approaches, of theories, one against the other, point, counterpoint. Greetings, I'm Michael Quinn Patton, here to talk with you about how program evaluators decide what approach to take, what options they have, based upon different evaluation theories and theorists, among which I count myself. The famous applied psychologist and pioneer in social inquiry, Kurt Lewin, famously said, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. Or an observation attributed to Albert Einstein, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. What precipitates these ruminations is publication of a new third edition of the classic book, Evaluation Roots, subtitled Theory Influencing Practice, written and edited by Marv Alkin and Tina Christie. In this book, they've updated the theories and the theorists, and they have changed the theory tree from positioning theorists to positioning theories. Since its original publication in 2004, Evaluation Roots has become a mainstay of evaluation. It's used in theory courses, in workshops. It's become both important and highly influential as a way of depicting theory and theorists. In this video, I'll review the evolution of the evaluation theory tree over the last two decades through three editions of the Evaluation Roots book. And in so doing, I will conclude that the evaluation theory tree's success and influence has made it ironically less useful today because of the isolation of theorists and theories on separate branches, when in fact, in practice, the work of theorists has become more integrated across the dimensions of use, methods, and value. I'll look at the ways in which the prototyping done at the end of the book offers a hopeful way forward for depicting the increasing diversity of the evaluation forest beyond a single tree with different branches. All that is ahead. This is the first version of the theory tree, which placed theorists on one of three branches, the use branch, the methods branch, or the valuing branch. Tina Christie describes how the image of the theory tree emerged. Uh, we were working with an art history student and we took a look at a, um, a painting, a very well-known painting uh, called Modern Art in America. And if you take a look at that visual image, it's a, it's a tree and there are these leaves and it's very intricate. And what you see are, you know, the influence of these great painters, these great artists, and then how they influence other people's work. The more fluid thought, this could potentially be uh, a very um, thoughtful way to visually depict the relationship between the work of evaluation scholars, in particular, those who write about evaluation theory, and again, these are theories of practice, um, and to show their relationships and to, um, and to show some historical evolution, but not in a very traditional flowchart kind of way, in a way that was more flexible, more fluid, and that would allow a, a, a visual representation of those relationships. So there you have the story of how the evaluation tree concept emerged. Marv Alkin was a founder and the first director of the Center for the Study of Evaluation at UCLA some five decades ago. His extensive work on evaluation theory led to his receiving 
the American Evaluation Association Paul F. Lazarsfeld Evaluation Theory Award, as well as the AEA Research on Evaluation Award. Marv famously developed an evaluation theory seminar in which students would take a theorist and study their work and then have to present themselves as that theorist in a class presentation. Marv and Tina wrote about that use of role playing to teach evaluation, and I was often called by students during that seminar to interview me as part of their preparation for playing Michael Patton and utilization focused evaluation in the seminar. To learn more about Marv and his many contributions to evaluation, to have a look at the volume that Christina Christie and Ann Vo edited on evaluation use and decision making in society, a tribute to Marv Alkin. Given his extensive research on evaluation use and theorizing about the factors affecting evaluation use, Marv Alkin has placed himself from the beginning on the use branch of the theory tree. We're going to take a look at the use branch to see how that changed from beginning to the current volume, uh, and then take a look at the implications of this reframing of the theory tree. This is the 2008 version of the theory tree revisited. So when we put the two theory trees side by side, the 2008 theory revisited version that features theorists and the 2023 version that features theories, evaluation theories, we see that in the new version, Stuffelbeam becomes the root of the use branch in context input process and product. Joe Holy becomes results oriented management and evalu for evaluation. Marv Alkin has a new chapter in the book on what he is calling context sensitive evaluation focused on youth. My book on utilization focused evaluation moves from naming me as a theorist to that approach. Fetterman's empowerment evaluation. Preskill moves to learning centered evaluation. Cousins becomes practical participatory collaborative evaluation. And Jean King moves from being identified as a theorist to her approach of interactive evaluation appearing in the 2023 theory tree. John Owen is gone. And under practical policy evaluation, Eleanor Chelinsky is added, as well as the addition of developmental evaluation as an outgrowth of the 2023 use theory tree. Similar transitions from theorists to theories took place on the methods and valuing branches, which I won't go into. Instead, I'll turn now to the overall influence of the theory tree, its contributions, some of the controversies about it, and my assessment of its current status. The evaluation theory tree has evolved over time, adding new theorists. The theory tree has raised discussions about what a global evaluation theory tree would look like. In 2012, Marv Alkin and Fred Carden did an article in the Journal of Multidisciplinary Evaluation on some of the international perspectives that could inform the theory tree. And as the book has become more important and significant, it has been surrounded by greater controversy. What theorists are included, what theorists are not included, where they positioned on the tree. David Fetterman, representing empowerment evaluation, is on the use branch of the tree. Should he be on the valuing branch? Carol Weiss is on the methods branch. Should she be on the use branch? Why should a theorist just be on one branch? And is the image of a tree the right way to capture variations in theorists? The methods branch has been criticized for being too dominated by quantitative experimental theorists, ignoring qualitative theorists and mixed methods theorists, and adding theory-driven evaluation, which can be considered a more conceptual framing 
than a methodological one. The valuing branch has been criticized as being a hodgepodge of inconsistent approaches from Scriven to Merton's and treating constructivist theory, fourth generation evaluation, for example, of Lincoln and Guba as being more values oriented than methodologically oriented, despite their heavy emphasis on naturalistic inquiry and qualitative methods. It calls for a social justice branch to be added to the use methods and valuing branches. Jennifer Billman at an American Evaluation Association annual conference session put faces on the tree and asked, how can the evaluation theory tree thrive in a world of diverse philosophies when it remains rooted within a narrow Euro-Western philosophical soil? As word of a planned third edition emerged, Vinyu Shankar and colleagues organized a petition calling for action on unearthing evaluation roots that attracted more than 600 signatures. It said, in part, the field of evaluation's whiteness is ubiquitous and harmful. Members of our field have actively oppressed the voices of those whose otherization through artificial categories of race, gender, sexuality, class, and ability status, it has exacerbated. This oppression has diseased our roots as a field, confining our practice and profession, traumatizing members of our field, and harming the communities that we claim to serve through our work. Vidna Shanker has an article with Rodney Hopson in the new uh, volume, as do uh, Fiona Cram and Joanne Choyard, who have written about culturally responsive indigenous evaluation. It is indicative of the book's significance, influence, and importance that it has both been widely used and greatly cited, and at the same time, the source of controversy and, and an organized campaign demanding changes in the new edition. Evaluation theory tree is widely used in evaluation theory courses and basic introductory courses to evaluation to show students the diversity of approaches, what their preferred approach is. A creative example reported in the AEA 365 blog took place in Chicago in 2015 at the American Evaluation Association Annual Conference where Catherine Hoke and Deborah Gradinsky gave participants in the conference an opportunity to self-identify where they fit on the evaluation theory tree, to uh, interest in alternative ways of portraying different approaches. There are many ways of trying to categorize evaluation. One of those undertaken by Stuart Donaldson, the director of the Evaluators Institute and the Claremont Evaluation uh, Program, an author of books on theory-driven evaluation, uh, worked with colleagues to portray the Evaluation Purposes River. This is a depiction that, that looks at different purposes for evaluation, beginning at the top with accountability, then in the orange determining merit, worth, and significance, in the bright green uh, uh, emphasizing social justice, which has an offshoot tributary of transforming stakeholders. Um, evaluation practice in the blue runs into the lake or ocean of societal improvement. And beginning at the bottom with the yellow, knowledge generation, understanding program mechanisms. In the green, evaluation use to, in the tributaries, enhance innovation, build evaluation capacity and learning, and empowering stakeholders. Um, there have been other efforts to depict the variety of evaluation approaches. This one of the more creative ones. Michael Scriven, in contrast, has been conceptualizing the entire field as a transdisciplinary field, like statistics and philosophy, that cuts across and serves other disciplines. In his chapter in the New Evaluation Roots book, he talks about a trans-scientific theory of evaluation. This builds on his longtime interest in supporting evaluative reasoning, evaluative judgment, 
the logic of evaluation, evaluative thinking, meta-evaluation, his comprehensive evaluation checklist. Imagine a conceptual branch of the theory tree where the evaluation theory tree would be placed that included these different ways of conceptualizing the emphasis on evaluation itself. Again, I'll return to this momentarily. Here's an example of what such a conceptual branch of the theory tree might include. Evaluative reasoning, the logic of evaluation, evaluative thinking, standards and principles, meta-evaluation, theory-driven evaluation, which I think is more conceptual than methodological, evaluation theory itself, transdisciplinary evaluation, evaluation science, trans-scientific evaluation, and the evaluation theory tree as having a prominent place on the conceptual branch of evaluation roots. An example of this kind of thinking came from Sebastian Lemire, Laura Peck, and Alan Porowski in a article in the Policy Studies Journal inspired by the Evaluation Theory Tree entitled The Growth of the Evaluation Tree in the Policy Analysis Forest, Recent Developments in Evaluation, published in 2020. They create a new version of the evaluation tree that has several interesting additions, which are more conceptual in nature. The evaluative thinking branch, evaluative capacity building, evaluation standards and criteria, systematic reviews, systems thinking and complexity theory. These are just some of the creative examples of the widespread influence of evaluation roots and the theory tree over the last two decades. For my part, I have been honored to be on the evaluation theory tree from the first edition under the use branch and in the latest edition and the only theorist to have two spots on the tree, both utilization focused evaluation and now developmental evaluation. As an old, white, straight, and clearly very privileged male, I come to these reflections with a deep sense of how limited my own perspective is and how much I've benefited from the ways in which our profession has developed over these years. I offer these reflections as part of a dialogue toward a profession that more effectively contributes to a more equitable and sustainable world. Despite being a hot off the press new edition, the 2023 evaluation theory tree, in my judgment, is already out of date. Out of date because the book fails to include the influence and contributions of the evaluation theory tree to theory over the last two decades. What is missing from the theory tree is the theory tree. I'm basically arguing that over the last two decades, the theory tree contribution and influence has been to have everyone who is thinking about how to approach evaluation address use methods and valuing in such a way that they don't become distinct and prioritized, but instead become interrelated. And I think what that helps us do is get a more realistic approach and understanding of how theorists operate. We know that how one asks questions affects the answers that you get. Alkin and Christie ask, for each theorist or theory, what is the main emphasis between methods valuing and use? On which branch of the theory tree, methods valuing or use, does the theory best fit? And so we get the current theory tree. But let's imagine asking a different question. How does the theorist or theory conceptualize the relationship between methods valuing and use? What is distinct? about how a theory conceptualizes this inner relationship that makes it distinctive. And if we answer that question, what we end up with is a panorama, a forest 
of distinct evaluation approaches, each one of which has a distinct relationship between values, methods, and use. The implication of this overall is to release the theory tree, let it go, and to replace it with a forest of many different trees. And that that takes us into what the book ends up doing at the end. It offers a final chapter that is prototyping different theories, not based on the theory tree, but looking at each theory by itself. Chapter 23 studies the theory prototypes and considers the various elements presented and the extent to which each one may or may not fit your particular value system and context. And so chapter 23 presents the theories, each as a distinct theory, each offering a particular approach to evaluation without attachment to the theory tree. Marv Alka and Tina Christie with Naomi Stephan go even further than they did in the book. In an article published in the Journal of Multidisciplinary Evaluation as a supplement to evaluation routes. In that article, they take the protocols approach and make it comparative. So that what they say is that in order for theories to influence practice effectively, theories must be displayed in a way that allows for easy comparison. This comparison of three theory prototypes demonstrates that prototypes, that is, individual theories can be an effective way for selecting a prescriptive theory when conducting an evaluation. They continue, in this paper we take our process a step further, further than they did in the book, by providing three theory prototypes, empowerment evaluation from David Fetterman, utilization focused evaluation from yours truly, and learning centered evaluation from Hallie Preskill. Next, we provide a comparison of these theories based on the prototypes that shows the differences in procedures that might help practitioners determine which theory would be best for use in a particular evaluation. And we can take this transition farther from branches on an individual tree to a forest of diverse trees to an ecosystem perspective. When my daughter and evaluation partner Charmaine Campbell-Patton saw the image of the multiple trees, she said, but what you still have are trees that are not rooted. We're talking about evaluation roots. An ecosystem approach would identify the roots of each tree in an ecosystem of stakeholders, intended users, politics, culture, society, economy, relationships with other evaluation approaches. In a companion video, I'll take a deeper look at how the theorists in the Evaluation Roots book actually integrate valuing methods and use based on what they've written in the chapters of the book. What I want to do now is take a deeper look at the sources of the transition from the theory tree with its three branches to a diverse prototype-based evaluation forest of diverse approaches. I'll offer three reasons for changing the question of how we make sense of and group theories. The question that guides the theory tree of what is the main emphasis between methods valuing and use ends up being a linear reductionist framing of the question. In contrast, the question of how does each theorist or theory conceptualize the relationship between methods valuing and use is a systems framing question. And increasingly, we're understanding and the field of evaluation is moving towards systems thinking, understanding complex dynamic interconnections. As the systems concepts and complexity understandings have become increasingly important in evaluation, those understandings ought to frame how we think about evaluation theories themselves. When we examine then 
the interactions and interdependence of use, valuing, and methods within any given theoretical approach, I think we get a more realistic picture of the theory-practice connection, of how evaluation theorists actually go about doing their work in looking at the interactions and interdependence of use, valuing, and methods within any given context. The concept of intersectionality might be illuminative here. Introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, intersectionality was the insight that our individual identities have multiple dimensions. We're not just defined by race or by gender or by sexual orientation, but all of these dimensions can come into play. That our who we are is a function of the intersection of race, ethnicity, gender identity, social class, the language we speak, our religion, our sexuality, our age, our body size, uh, our geography, that intersectionality is a multiple notion of individual identity. And I'm suggesting we can apply that same kind of thinking to evaluation theory. If we apply the idea of intersectionality to evaluation theory, then instead of a theory being identified by a single dimension on a single branch, like valuing methods or use, any given theory is characterized by the interconnections and multiple dimensions of valuing methods and use. So I've offered three developments that make prioritizing a single theorist's emphasis obsolete in the way in which the theory tree is organized. First is that the evaluation theory tree has influenced all practicing theorists to incorporate valuing methods and use in their practice. Second, systems thinking directs us to examine interrelationships rather than linear reduction as causal linkages. And practicing evaluation in the face of the challenges of today's world requires a more integrated systems understanding of theory dimension. I want to close by expressing my sincere and deep appreciation for what Marv Alkin and Tina Christie have contributed to the profession through the work on the theory tree. From the original inspiration of the theory tree and two decades of work on the theory tree, revising it, updating it, they have made a huge difference. You have made a huge difference, Marvin and Tina, to our profession. You have brought before us the importance of thinking in terms of use, methods, and valuing. And I'm serious in saying that that success and that contribution has been so important as to make thinking in these terms integral to how all theorists and practitioners engage in their work. But now, in an integrated way rather than a single priority. And the chapter in which you begin to lay out the forest of evaluation approaches, I think foretells well the capturing of an ever more in diverse and panoramic approach to evaluation in the future. Your contributions in pushing the connection between theory and practice and having us understand it and take it into account has made a huge difference to the profession and certainly to my own practice. An example of the influence on my own work in understanding the theory-practice connection is manifest in a video I did where I review over a hundred different evaluation approaches and provide some dimensions to compare those evaluation approaches in a YouTube video. I'll have the link to that at the very end of this video. In alignment with the theme of the 2023 Annual Conference of the American Evaluation Association, The Power of Story, and consistent with the conclusion of the chapter on culturally responsive indigenous evaluation, which concludes, quote, we contend that culturally responsive indigenous evaluation is not a branch, but rather the roots that secure the tree within the richness of the territory of evaluation.
Here then is an indigenous story about trees and the forest that gives us insights into the forest of evaluation and the diverse trees therein. This is a Maori creation story that I first encountered when I went to work with colleagues in New Zealand years ago. And it is the final story in the developmental evaluation book because it beautifully captures the nature of experimentation, learning, and development. I'm going to pick up the story where Tane, the eldest of the siblings who were born from the union of Father Sky and Mother Earth, is planting trees to adorn Mother Earth. But he's never planted trees before, and so at first he plants a tree with the leaves in the earth and the roots in the air, and it shrivels up and dies. So he tries again laying the trees flat on the earth, and again they die. But the third time, he plants the roots in the earth and the leaves in the air, and not only does the plants grow and the trees grow, but the birds and the animals come. And Tane becomes the god of the forest and recognizes that the trees are part of a larger ecosystem. Tane proceeds to go around the world planting trees that are particularly appropriate and adapted to each unique landscape, where the landscape includes the relationships between diverse flora and fauna. And in that worldwide diversity of forests and trees, we can take lessons for thinking about the metaphor of an evaluation forest that illustrates the diversity of evaluation approaches, each located within a landscape, a landscape that's natural, that's political, that's cultural, that's societal, that's economic, and that as we develop a deeper understanding of the theory practice connection, it includes the ways in which nature and the real world constitute diverse living adaptive ecosystems. And so with that, conclude here by suggesting that we let the theory tree go and enjoy creating a new forest of evaluation made up of many, many different varieties of evaluation. This is the first of two videos focused on the theory tree and evaluation roots. In the second video, I will go into depth looking at the implications for a forest approach, an ecosystem approach for the theorists featured in evaluation roots.